Hi there folks, how's it going? Um, just getting everyone, seeing who's there. Let's see. So, Rupert Chitta, hi, how's it going? Thanks for sending your work in, much appreciated. And Alison, and Teresa, and Stuart. Excellent. Yeah, I went, popped out this morning and just went up to the allotment um, and just thought I'd give things a bit of a water. Um, so when I went up there, I was thinking maybe I should start a YouTube channel about allotments, but uh, unfortunately, I don't think it'd be quite so good. Um, I'm sort of fighting a bit of a battle there at the moment just to keep on top of it. And um, despite the lockdown, I still feel like really busy all the time. So... Ah, oh, and Phil. Hi, Phil. So, yeah, such is life. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's nice weather, so hopefully I get out there at some point. Um, okay, so I've had quite a bit of work sent in, so we'll get straight on to Photoshop and uh, see what we've got. Okay. So you can ask me any questions in the chat box, and uh, and hopefully I'll be able to help you out. Okay. Okay, so starting off we've got uh, Rupert Chitter's drawing here which is uh, very nice. Let's have a look. Um, Yeah, so really nice drawing this. Now I'm not sure, it's difficult to tell and I would hate to um, get this wrong, but I don't know whether, whether um, if you saw this Rupert Chitter, whether you used a ruler for some of these lines. Um, because it's got a very nice, I mean, I really like it. I think it's an excellent drawing. And of course, having a ruler doesn't solve all the problems for you. Um, but it would account for these very nice, crisp diagonals. Let's have a look. Um, so yeah, um, now in some respects, I think this is probably looking at it, the perspective feels pretty good. I can't see any, nothing jumps out at me as being particularly problematic. Um, I guess the only, perhaps if I was being picky, let's see, the only one might be this, um, let's see. If we go for a red. And uh, yeah, this one. So that one there. Now it goes up to here. Okay, so we've got that line. Now if we were to carry that on, that would basically go. With me. Let's say that one goes like that, and this one goes like that. So that would mean it would go there. And as you can see, these lines here, um, they don't so much look, um, I don't know if they are converging, but they look a bit more parallel to me. Um, so whether um, Again, we have to imagine that distant, that horizon line. In this case, our eye level is probably above the picture plane. Um, so it looks like those might be parallel where they should be converging. And then if we put this one, oh, so there, there. And as you can see, that's at quite a steep angle. So what that would mean is, you know, these two are gonna converge there. So obviously that's just perhaps a little bit steep um, because everything should be converging at eye level. And we can tell eye level is above the picture plane because this line here is still going up. So that means eye level would have been a bit higher. Okay, so those are just uh, a couple of little bits, but um, 
and that's just being a bit picky really so um, but the thing is I say if you want to improve your perspective drawing then um, you have to assume that it's going to take you you know it will take you a while but actually going through this process of correcting it or actually finding the vanishing point and seeing where you went wrong might just help accelerate that process so art uh, spot on yeah so oh and hi Val hi excellent yeah so yeah as I say you know that's just the nature of it and I'm sure you know if I was to do these um we'll see a bit later Teresa's done some of these drawer box exercises and uh, these things they don't come particularly easy that you do have to sort of practice with them um, so beginning but yes I really like it it reminds me a bit of um, one of my favorite books on drawing is drawing seeing and observation by Ian Simpson and uh, it's just an it's an excellent book if um, if for anything just because of the examples of the drawing and uh, I particularly like this it's just got this nice quality of observation in particular here just seeing the inside of these ellipses here let's see down there so that one there particularly works well and there's a few that's nicely done nicely observed the ellipses on the diagonal so yeah um, a good example of how quite a simple subject can be made into something with good observation so yeah we like that very good and then over here this is Rupert Chitter's one so this is one I think she's been working on now for a little while and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good example of uh, a lot of the theory we've covered. Um, so we've got our um, scale. So we've got, you know, perhaps slightly larger objects here with this smaller one in the distance. So you've got your scale. Um, you've got obviously the slightly bigger bottle and then the smaller bottle in the background. Nice tonal contrast. Um, so you've got scale, you've got overlap. Again, that's quite nicely helped out by the um, pattern on this fabric, because if you imagine without the fabric, you wouldn't necessarily have the overlaps. But we've got overlap there, overlap there, overlap there. And so that helps just to create some depth in the picture plane. And um, yeah, I think I, I like the way the highlights are done and the overall feel of the painting is really nice. And uh, particularly, this, I think the handling of the background with sort of sneaking in this blue against the yellow of the lemons works well and stops it all from being perhaps too warm. So, yeah, I really like that painting. I think that's very nice. Um, there we go. So, yeah, very good. Of course, you can see me looking at that, but uh, I need to somehow create a little way so I can look at the messages while I'm doing it. But there we go. Um, so who next? So we've got Stuart next. Um, so this is um, this is one of these problems of. Uh, so there's a bit of a problem with photography here. So you'll see this slight skewing. So I can show you how I correct it in Photoshop. Um, basically all the cameras have a fisheye lens um, now some of them might correct for it but if I adjust it there and crop in that crops in and then what I do is there's a tool here like so we go around the outline and Again, I'm certainly not an expert in um, Photoshop, but um, I can do these little corrections, obviously. Okay, so you can just stretch it back to something more like how it might have been um, if you were looking at it face on. Okay, and Stuart's still suffering a little bit from glare on the, um, the wet surface and just picking things up there. Now, Stuart sent me in a, oh yeah, that was his drawing. Um, but yeah, that looks that looks good. Looks good, Stuart. Um, I guess the one thing that comes to mind here is, um, again, you, the issue is with the lighting. So if I was to look at this picture, I couldn't tell you where the light was coming from, okay? 
and as we saw with the reference material I supplied because you're working with blocks basically the books as like block like shapes a nice clear light source should um, help you to say a little bit more about these three-dimensional shapes because without the strong lighting the planes like the top plane facing up and the side plane and all the planes have about the same tonal value and so you don't get quite as good a, a clear as understanding of the um, the forms that you're looking at so i would play around with the lighting there but other than that i can see you've got one two three four books stacked on so yeah good um good one there um, I don't know whether you've got a bit, but some of this red might be reflected in the top of this black book. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, but yeah, overall, a good effort. Uh, the perspective on this book looks, um, looks good to me. Um, and because of the reference, but, uh, because of how you've sent it in, it's a little, it's a slightly challenging for me to analyse it because again, there's some of the edges are a bit loose. Um, which isn't a problem. Overall, the effect looks quite convincing to me. Um, but I would, I wouldn't give up on um, at least drawing books, setting them up, doing these drawings, and again just refining that um, that sense of perspective. So yeah. Okay. Now, this is a very nice drawing uh, by Stuart. Again, um, looking at two point perspective. And uh, I was just looking at this, trying to work out what to say. So um, whether you can, let's see, you might be able to notice this. It's sort of right, but there's something a bit odd about it. Okay. And what's odd about it is, um, the fact that the two vanishing points are within our within the field of vision, okay, um, and what, what I think what it does here is it creates the feeling that um, for a start we're working with a horizon line down here, so this is where our eye level is. So we're looking up at these books, um, and then I think bringing the vanishing points that close together gives you the feeling that you're looking up at something massive maybe like a block of flats or something so when you look at smaller objects although the uh, perspective lines are converging um, because the object's small the, com the lines converge uh, quite slowly so to most people they would probably look parallel so the more that you sort of see that perspective, it sort of normally implies that you're looking at something bigger, like a building or something like that. And so, as I say, bringing those two vanishing points within the uh, the page, I think, creates a feeling that we're looking at this very large, um, almost enormous, monumental stack of books, which, you know, isn't a bad thing, but it's useful for you to be just aware of the effect of putting those two vanishing points there um, and also the effect of having them all above the eye line but I still like it I think it's nicely done and uh, I think it's a nice drawing so yeah I think it's good so just be aware of that though um, where you put your vanishing points so let's see next Teresa so yeah Teresa has done this very good uh, version of the um, the one that I did uh, on Wednesday and uh, yeah I like what she's done here um, she did have some comments to say she found some of still working a bit with the medium um, but I think let's see brightness contrast Um, so I was trying to think, so one thing I think might have happened here, and she can put in the comments whether this is right or not, the yellow here looks a little bit cool, so I don't know whether she might have included some lemon yellow in that, let's see, there we go, 
my shows all right. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, whether this lemon is a bit, this yellow is maybe perhaps a bit cool. So remember, overall, it's quite a warm painting. Um, and this red here in the far, again, just from the photograph, it almost looks a little bit like alizarin crimson or a bit purpley. So that might be just creating a, a small sense of coolness in uh, in the picture so you could probably play a bit with um, just warming the whole thing up again you're trying to look at when I do this um, color balance okay if I warm the whole thing up like this I'll exaggerate the effect orange and you see by doing that what I sort of do is it's obviously much, it's clearer that it's a warm painting. Okay, so let's go like that. So it's like the whole thing is bathed in this warm light. Now, you may not want to do that, um, but when you're thinking about your colours, um, it's best just to make it one thing and some of the blacks and this these green this sort of yellow maybe just a little bit cool okay so I hope that's not um, being overly critical because it's a very nice very nice painting um, and I can see yeah you're talking about um, sort of how to work with the paint once it's on so what I like to do is once I've got enough paint on there, then basically I'm continually cleaning the brush. So there's no paint on the brush and then actually just working with the paint that's on there, going over it. Because here I can see on this line here, there's like an intermediary colour, but it hasn't been mixed. It's just painted. Um, and some artists work like that where they don't really mix. It's just tile after tile of separate colours. Um, but if you want to mix and blend, then just clean your brush and you just have to have the confidence to sort of drag it over the areas, pull the paint in certain directions and um, you'll gradually get a feel for it. It's just really a case of paying very close attention to what's going on and refining it and refining it and refining it and you'll slowly get more control. So. Um, but yeah, very nice. And then Teresa also submitted these. So again, I'm going to be, um, it's yeah, a good study. Um, I say I'm sort of reluctant to do this because I always, I think there's nothing worse than someone just sort of, um, I should do a few of these myself and you can, uh, you can see where I go wrong because again this isn't an easy thing to do um, but if we go here 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 okay and here here and here we can see that these lines are diverging so that's uh, that's incorrect um, now um, someone I think mentioned it, or maybe it was Teresa mentioned this on this, this one, this book appears to diverge as well. Perhaps I'm sure there's a way to do this. So that line goes up there and that line seems to go at a, an angle like that. So you can observe that correctly. Basically, there can be problem. You know, the book can be deformed. So if this is the open bit and that's the spine, it might just be that the book has become slightly uh, warped, and so it will skew the perspective. And uh, that's one of these. Um, there's a tension there between what reads well in the painting and drawing from observation. So again, you get that if you go and draw in Lavenham and you try and draw the buildings in perspective. They're all so warped and higgledy-piggledy that um, 
often they will look almost like a bad drawing because the perspective's all wrong. So you have to decide there, do you want to draw it as inaccurate perspective or do you want to draw it in accurate observation? And there's no sort of right or wrong there. So it's just a case of either choosing one or the other. Um, but you don't want to do it in a way that hurts the picture too much. I don't think that's a problem there. Um, but that's, you know, that's the tension between those two. But yeah, otherwise that looks that looks fine. Um, this one is slightly diverging, um, but I'm guessing that was because of the way the book, um, that one goes up like that. And this one comes along like that. So again, oh, that's exaggerating it slightly. Um, yeah, so they look like they're diverging ever so slightly. Um, but I think that's probably just the way the book was lying. So, um, so again, just, just be aware of that um, when you're practicing. And let's see if anyone's got anything to say about that. If you've used the wrong colour, um, what you have to do, as soon as you put the colour down, you should always be asking yourself, is that the right colour? Okay. Um, and what I often see is when people are painting, they will have a bit of a mix. They'll put something on. It might be the wrong colour and then they'll carry on painting with the assumption that basically it will all turn out for the best in the end. Um, and uh, I think that's, I can sort of understand why it is because who says, you know, does it matter if it's the right colour and this sort of thing. Um, but it's better to be able to change your colours deliberately than just uh, do it because of you couldn't find the right colour. So every time you put the brush stroke down, you should ask yourself, can I correct it? Could it be better? Okay. And um, it doesn't have to be um, it, when you're painting, say, when you're doing the blocking in phase, you're not trying to get every little subtle colour variation. You're just trying to get the general feel. OK. And in that still life, um, everything was illuminated with quite a warm light. And so really that should have perhaps the yellow should um, definitely be a warm sort of yellow as opposed to that lemon yellow. Otherwise, it will just look a bit, um, it will look ever so slightly sort of um, off because um, the greens would be desaturated under a warm light. So here we go. So this is Teresa's um, working through the drawer box exercises. So if you're interested in doing those, I put a link uh, down below to draw a box and you can follow along. They have a series of uh, lessons and I think there's some good YouTube videos and uh, I've done a few of them myself. And uh, if you've got the patience, you can, you know, um, they have a challenge whereby you do a hundred of these boxes. And the idea is you draw out your box. Once you've understood the perspective, you then draw out the box as freehand and then extend the lines and basically do what we're doing here is try and analyze, have you got it right? Have you got it wrong? Um, and of course, if you do one or two, you're gonna sort of get the idea. If you do a hundred, hopefully it's gonna go in. And so whenever you go out sketching churches, buildings, walls, you know, anything that's sort of man-made like that, the perspective is going to come to you much, much more easily. OK, um, unfortunately, it's one of those things that can really just throw off a painting or a drawing. If, if the perspective is off, then it can cause problems. So it is definitely it's it's an area that's worth investing some time and practice in. But these are very nicely done. So that's yeah, like that. And I think the draw a box exercise encourages you to learn how to draw these things freehand. OK. Um, and, oh, there we are. Freehand. So there's an art in drawing efficiently freehand. And he goes into some detail about doing these um, ghosting lines, which I've mentioned in my lesson. But you basically train, you move your whole arm as opposed to your hand 
and then you can get more efficient sort of smooth lines. Um, so maybe at some point I'll do a video on those and try and go through some of the exercises myself because uh, I think I think it's good. So those are Teresa's. Thanks for those. Um, then Val has sent this in, which is a very nice little study. So let's uh, we'll crop that in. Okay. Again, um, better picture here. Not just not quite so much glare. So like that. Um, and let's have a look. Now, again, the lighting. Um, so this apple has got one, two light sources, okay? And it's got some cast shadow coming this way and against the wall. That's not really reflected so much in the side of the apple, okay? Um, and the top of the apple is also, um, a little bit uniform so there's not much light and dark to suggest um, you know that part of the apple the way it dips in um, and the light is coming and hitting the apple you would assume from this direction with the cast shadow there but this book is dark on this side and light on that side so it may be it may have been like that so I don't I don't know but from the point of view of the painting, it would have helped to have that slightly more simpler lighting situation. So, and I'll just illustrate this as I have done. I sort of quite like doing these little corrections. So we'll do some sort of green. Let's make that. Okay, so if we darken this side of the apple, Okay, and then darken there. And you see that creates a little bit more. So what I would do in this case, now I know that these reflections do appear. So I'm not, I certainly wouldn't say they were wrong because often you can have low windows and stuff like that. However, it might not help the, the draw. So you're better off with simpler lighting. So in this case, um, let's go. That. with a light source there maybe a little bit there okay catching the inside of that so that would be a bit simpler and then also the planes of the book you've got the upper plane here and this the side plane they're very equal so again that doesn't help communicate the three-dimensional aspect of the book so um, an example might be that the top of the book is let's imagine the top of the book is a bit lighter that's probably too light okay if we lighten the top of the book like so Okay, and then this plane now looks a bit more in shadow. Okay, but again, this book you would want to be the same as well. Although, I so say, you will perhaps get a bit of a cast shadow on the top of that book, but down here you would want a bit more light just catching that corner, maybe. Okay, um, other than that, the perspective, uh, let's so we'll go to our. Uh, Perspective looks good. Um, so we've got a line there. That's a bit big, isn't it? Um, let's bring that down. So this line here. Okay, and that line there. So that looks good. So that would suggest our vanishing point or our eye level is here. Okay. Um, but what does this mean for this book down here? So this comes here and this has got a long way to go before it gets to our vanishing point. And in fact, this one here. Okay. So that feels uh, possibly not quite right. 
Um, this is converging here though. Ooh. That one's going up there, and that one is going up there. So that looks a bit better on that side. Um, so again, Val, you might just want to try sort of drawing that out a few times um, and just paying particular attention to those diagonals, just to sort of get a sense. Um, but as we said in the previous one, different books will have different little sort of uh, quirks to them. So just be aware of that. Um, let's see, any more questions? Okay. <laughs> now, we're on to Alison's. So Alison's done this excellent painting here. I really like this. Um, let's crop this in just ever so slightly. Okay, obviously the photograph is um, it's got a little bit of glare on it, which um, is uh, just sort of um, detracting from it ever so slightly. Um, it just in that I can't sort of I can't see the tonal values quite as accurately. Um, but um, a paint as a painting, I think is really nice. I think it's got um, yeah. Let's there we look back at it. Um, Things that perhaps, so the first, the only thing I can say with the perspective is um, this book looks fine and it really does have a good sense of sitting down and this box looks good as well, okay? Um, the only one that looks a little bit off is that book at the bottom, okay? And it's just that that line there, let's go for a different colour it shows up that line appears to come up a bit like that okay and this one perhaps I'm exaggerating that that looks like they're diverging slightly okay so that's the only one that looks like problematic because that one looks like it's about that looks good that one okay and as I say that that's maybe a bit picky because overall it's a very nice um, drawing the um, painting the other thing may be is um, Alison is I think that that candle flame I think could be a little bit smaller, okay? Um, now, here's a question for you, see if anyone, if anyone knows the answer to this. Um, do, do you know the artist who's famous for doing the, um, you know that there's like a bird, it's like a science experiment and they're all standing around looking at the, there's like a bird in a glass jar and I think they've taken the oxygen out. Does anyone know that one? I feel free to type in the answer. I'll try and think of him, but he's very uh, sort of famous for um, painting these uh, uh, sort of very dark, almost like Caravaggio um, sort of uh, scenes. I'll try and think of him and then uh, I can send you the link. But there's one in particular where he's got a, a candle, which is uh, really good. Now, if I, um, let's see if I can do this. So, in fact, if I use the orange, okay, if I use the orange, um, okay, I'm just making that um, flame a little bit smaller, okay. So again, I think maybe with the candle, it might just be a case of less is more. Um, now, if I do a really big um, sort of orange, orangey red, maybe. Okay. And then maybe a little bit of red around it or something like that. Um, but I would probably be, I would probably look to just lessen that effect of the candle just something like that. 
and then just have a touch of the white in the middle. Something like that. Okay, that's just a suggestion. Um, again, you would have to sort of play around with that. I think maybe, maybe that looks better, but yeah, it's just, um, if I can find that artist, he's got a great one of someone um, looking by candle. And again, you just really have to, again, you're observing and you're trying to see, um, but it's a bit like a tree. You're trying to judge what's the size of the flame in relation to the candlestick itself. And um, if I was also going to be a little bit picky, I might say this candlestick would also be um, adhering to perspective. So here the ellipse goes up slightly. So that suggests maybe we're at eye level. Um, but some of these things are perhaps just ever so slightly vague. Um, although we can see this lower ellipse down here. Um, and I can sort of understand, uh, you know, it can get slightly confusing, but at the same time, if you can get all those, they will all help to reinforce the feeling of perspective. So that's what I would suggest with that, Alison. Um, but this little box here is particularly well done. So I think it's a great little painting. So I'd be pleased with that. And then what have we got here? Ellie. So Ellie's got a nice painting here. Now, perhaps Ellie can also put in the comments whether she, this is, um, I'm assuming this is watercolor, although I'm not sure if it's, it almost looks like pastel. Um, but it's a nice little study of those books. Let's have a look. Joseph Wright, excellent. Yeah, Phil, that's great. So Joseph Wright, and there's one he did of a, uh, I think it's someone either reading by a candle or something like that. But uh, yeah, he's very good at sort of candlelight. So well worth a look. Um, so Ellie, yeah, so, um, now, the reason I ask whether it's watercolour or not is because um, it looks almost, it's somewhere between transparent and opaque. So some of it looks like it's been done in washers and some of it looks like there's almost hardly any, um, it's like almost dry brush. So we can see these effects here of the shadow they look almost dry brush in some respects. Um, so I think you may want to, um, you may want to, I don't know, well, let's see, what does she, let's see if she says, oh, it's in acrylic. Okay, that would make more sense, yeah. Um, so it looks, is it, a, it looks like maybe acrylic on paper, if I was having a guess. Um, and so with acrylic, um, painted in this way, you get a sort of strange combination where in some passages it looks like opaque and heavy and in some place, places it looks more like a transparent wash, okay? Um, I think with acrylic I would encourage you to paint thickly with it, okay? Um, you should, uh, if you haven't already, I always recommend looking at Hashim Akib, um, he's a great acrylic artist. And he's a big fan of using a acrylic paint in this very thick, almost opaque way. Um, so that would be one suggestion. The other suggestion is, um, so when I was looking at this apple, I think maybe here you've got quite a lot of colours going on. Again, you've got this strong green, you've got reds and the pinks. Um, now, if I take the apple... the apple now if I move it towards red like that maybe even yellow now you have to let me know what you think Deselect. so that might be a bit more harmonious so like that like that okay so all I've done there is just basically I think the green again might have been a little bit of a um, 
it's a cool colour where you've overall got this um, sort of warmer colour scheme. Um, but that's a bit of an aside um, because we're looking at the perspective um, and the, this book on top looks fine. Again, there's um, a sense of convergence there. This book here, maybe um, they, it looks a little bit parallel, these lines. Okay, so like so. Again, there must be some way of doing this as a straight line. Um, this one here. So yeah, I think they are converging, but you know they're going to converge a long way off. Okay, um, and also, so. Um, this line and this line, okay, this line and this line. Every, it's, if anything, I would say perhaps you're just nudging a bit more towards the, your lines being parallel and you want to try to, you've got it, you've definitely got it on this one here. So you've got it there and there. They do seem like they're converging a bit more. So again, we'll probably have a tendency. What I found when I started doing it is, I would then draw everything converging and I would probably overstate it. So you either do them parallel or you do them converging and eventually you get a sense of uh, how to get that about right. And it's sort of, it almost comes through feel in the end. Um, but yeah, nice, very nice painting that. Um, and what else have we got here? So Phil's last but not least um so i think this is an excellent uh, excellent painting and uh, really pleasing to see um just in a way how far phil's come on with his painting um this is a really nice watercolor study so i think maybe just picking up from that theme uh with ellie's what i i I like the colour scheme. I think overall it's nice and harmonious. It's all basically warm yellows, reds, browns. So the colours are working well. There's a nice, um, there's some nice tonal values on the apple with the highlight there. It's quite a subtle highlight, but it still reads against the mid values. Then the transition into the shadow. Um, and just the overall handling. I mean, the the shadow notes or the shadow areas um are maybe just a little bit blotchy so again they might you could do you could start to work on economy of style there phil just by big brush nice dark paint and just trying to do it in bigger bigger movements some of these watermarks and here and some of your marks there they, they're still suggesting a perhaps a slightly um, a smaller approach. So I would just encourage you to start to um, try to use these big brushes and try to, now you're getting your values, the values are, are coming along. You're getting your darks and lights, just try to do with a bit more economy of style. And then, so what I'm saying there is almost by doing that, you keep the shadows a bit quieter and then you can reserve your smaller marks for in the highlights. And as you can see, we've got the grain of the wood. So if Lindsay's watching, Lindsay gave me some feedback suggesting that I should have put the grain of the wood in. I think someone else mentioned this as well. Um, and yeah, I think that's right. I mean, here it's done really nicely, just with like subtle lines. And what's good here is that although Phil's put the, the grain of the wood in, it doesn't compete with the darks in other areas. And also very nice handling here of the um, the book. So again, we get a suggestion of the uh, the cover of the book there without overdoing it. And also some nice little lines there suggesting the pages. Um, other nice bits, I like this gradient here going from dark to light. So that's been pulled out, so that works well. Um, perhaps the only, oh, let's see, can we? I guess you probably know what's coming here. OK. 
Okay. Um, so again, not easy to do, but you know, if you mix up enough pigment, let's just see if we darken this background, if that helps or hinders. Okay, so if I bring that down a bit, I'm not going to bring it down to black because again, that would be very hard to do with watercolour. Um, Deselect. But maybe a slightly darker background may help, but you know, who knows? In, in some respects here, this is still the darkest dark. Um, but yeah, getting that strong tonal contrast isn't isn't as easy in the watercolours. So um, I think B. There we go. Just pushing the contrast. So if I push the contrast, what happens is the the yellows actually become darker, a little bit darker. The mid values become darker, and that means this highlight reads a little bit more strongly. Okay. So that's just playing with the contrast, maybe increasing the yellow slightly. Um, but that's those are just suggestions. We go back to the original. There we go. Uh, but yeah, very nice, very nice a watercolour painting that. So there we go. Uh, let's um, see how we're doing. Um, yes backgrounds are hard to do so um one of the things you can do is they're difficult when you're working from tubes um so what you might want to um do is if you've got one of those um you know like those clover little dishes with all the little you know two um little sort of dip um like almost bowls so you squeeze out the watercolor pigment a little tube of it and then you just mix in a little bit of uh, water with that and you're just trying to get that combination because you know watercolors we normally think of them as being quite small but people do much bigger watercolors but you have to basically squeeze that pigment out not put too much water in get the consistency right and then block it in remembering as if you're doing a wash basically so you're trying to tilt the board and then use that bead and then slowly bring down that dark. So I keep saying this, but maybe I should have a go at doing this and then I can I can demonstrate it to you. Because again, it's one of those things that does require a bit of practice. Using wax, yep, yeah, wax is a good thing you can do or masking. You could mask out your lights and that would be quite a good way of doing it. Uh, certainly with oil painting, you normally have this... Um, Normally you keep the, the um, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, uh, you can buy, um, I think with your darks, if you're using umber and Payne's grey, and it's usually the uh, brighter colours that are more expensive. Um, but certainly one of the ideas is that the, um, your shadows should be relatively quiet, and then you can put the interest in the lights. Or some artists might keep the lights very simple, almost just the white paper, and then put all the colour in the shadow. But uh, you don't want them competing. That's why I say you don't want to keep the, um, you don't want your shadows to be busy and your mid values to be busy as well. Good. Yeah. Well, that's, um, you have to work quickly, basically. The other thing is using your spray bottle. If you use your spray bottle, you can keep your um, surface. Oh yeah, oh, I think that's um. I think Phil's saying he's Scottish because he doesn't like to use much paint, but I might be wrong. But um, anyway, so thanks a lot for that, folks. I hope that was useful. Uh, thanks for sending all your work in. Always appreciate to have something to go with. Um, so I haven't completely finalised um what we're going to be doing next week, but um, my main sort of idea at the moment is to start working with landscape um perhaps compositional armatures and uh again how that's going to work out in terms of me doing uh, this format i would still stick to the three sessions a week format 
Um, but with the compositional devices, it may be a case of um, more like two demonstrations because the theory is relatively straightforward, but the theory doesn't um, is really most useful when it comes into practice. Anyway, I'll have a think about that over the weekend. Um, otherwise, I will see some of you. Uh, for those of you doing Zoom, we will have Zoom at uh, five past eleven. And for the rest of you, thanks for tuning in. Um, if you'd like to like the video, that's always much appreciated. And uh, as I say, I'll be here on Monday with some uh, with another um, subject for us to have a look at. OK, thanks a lot. And for the rest of you, thanks for tuning in. Um, if you'd like to like the video, that's always much appreciated. And uh, as I say, I'll be here on Monday with some uh, with another um, subject for us to have a look at. OK, thanks a lot.